sweet goodness, All I right. think we're live. All right. Food Service Power Plan Network, what is up? Welcome to the Culinary Academy, our once a, uh, once a month party where we get an awesome chef in our Food Service Power Plan community who walks us through an incredible meal and tells their story and we connect everybody. Say hi to that guy, Chef Scott McCarthy. What's up, brother? How are we doing? Good to be with you guys. We're doing great. Thanks for joining awesome. us tonight, Jeff. Yeah, definitely. We're excited to be here. So, uh, we're going from our new test kitchen here. So this is a, uh, a new thing for us. So we're super excited to, uh, to show off our new kitchen and cook some great food with you. Tell us, tell us about the new kitchen and why. Talk, just tell it, fill us real quick on Inform and, and you guys and everything you're doing. Yeah, so uh, we had some pretty big news this week. So Inform Marketing Group and Food Service Solutions Group actually merged. Um, so cool. um, um, Monday was our first day. So um, really kind of created in the Bay Area, kind of just, um, I like to call the super rep group. Uh, you know, just, uh, you know, putting a, a bunch of great European lines with the lines like uh, Rationale and Continental and CMA, stuff like that. So um, just be able to offer, uh, you know, the people in the Bay Area, just a, a complete package from start to finish. And um, yeah, we're super excited to kind of get started. And we kind of, uh, we inherit this kitchen um, from uh, the Food Service Solutions Group. So uh, it is like a European dream in here. Um, so I, I, we're in the Bay Area, but I do feel like I'm kind of in the south of France right now. So beautiful. It looks beautiful. Yeah. What, what cool times for you guys. Congrats on finding a way to in challenge to create opportunity and to build something new and a rebrand and a rebirth and everything you guys are doing. I think it's awesome. Way to go. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, it's, uh, it, you know, there's, this has been a crazy year for, I think, everybody. And, uh, you know, uh, we're just excited to have to be in this position. And um, it's a lot of hard work from everybody uh, you know, on both themes. But, um, yeah, we're super excited to see what the future brings. And, um, yeah, we're, we're, I'll say the word excited again. <laughs> it's going to be great. It's going to be great. Yeah. Okay, so totally. everybody, Scott picked out um, some Spanish paella. Chef, tell us about Spanish yes. paella, why you picked it what we're in for tonight. Yeah, so I think um, for me, I love paella because it is one of those dishes. Um, first, it kind of reminds me, I'm originally from New Orleans, so it's very similar to like a jambalaya, um, but obviously different flavor profile. But um, for me, paella is one of those things where I think it's very, um, people don't understand how it's cooked. They kind of feel like there's maybe some kind of uh, mystery towards it, um, but it is one of the most simple things to cook. I mean, it is basically like a rice dish. Um, you know, we're, um, so I, I really enjoy doing it in my kitchen. I do a lot. You can see the pan that I use, um, it's pretty beat up. So I, I put this on, um, you know, open fires on my grill, um, you know, wherever there's kind of heat, this can kind of go. So, um, yeah, it's just one of those dishes where you can kind of empty your, your refrigerator and use what you got and then kind of create something new. So it's, it's uh, one of those dishes that you can, um, like I said, it's, it really can, can kind of compose everything that you have um, and you can kind of see what flavor profile you come up with. I, I love it. And, and for everyone watching, you know, I'm gonna, uh, I'll post the recipe. I'm gonna, I'm gonna edit this tonight or tomorrow. I'll upload it to YouTube. You'll see the, like the, um, all the items needed, the recipe, how to do it. But Scott said, listen, people are like, they think paella is a big scary thing. It's really super simple something any of us can do at home. And I mean, I will tell you for me, just having someone walk me through the process is so huge to break it down, show me really how simple it is. So I can't wait for that. So afterwards, everyone, you can go to the YouTube channel and, and rewatch this or get the ingredients, et cetera, and cook at home. And I think you and, and yours will have a blast. Um, okay, Chef, tell us where to start, brother. I got my big right. cast iron pan and I got uh, an induction oven. Uh, induction Perfect. Stove. Yeah, so basically any type of, you know, this is one of the things that people I think start with paella and it's it's kind of, you know, they, they think about it and then they automatically stop with it because they think, I don't have a paella pan. I cannot make paella. And that's true that, you know, paella pan is, is, is an actual dish, but um, anything can be made in it. So you could take it from sauteing all the ingredients and throw it into a casserole and throw it into your oven. Um, or what Jason's doing, cast iron is an, an amazing um, choice and alternative to that. So it's really just about um, taking away all of the things that make you not do it and just start doing it and having some fun with cooking because cooking is all about creating emotions and having some fun with flavors. Mm. And you should always have a cocktail or a glass of wine or a beer or a sparkling water or something in your hand that you can enjoy because it's really about the experience that 
you put the good energy into the food, the food is going to um, not only nourish you, but it's going to create memories for everybody else. So um, that's why I love cooking. And that's why I love cooking. Beautifully BIA, said. It's, um, it, it's, it's one of those things where you gather, right? I mean, you, you kind of present it and, you know, everybody kind of sits and you, you get the oohs and the ahs. Um, but it, it's really about people being together. And that's why I cook and why I'm in this, you know, this part of the industry is because, um, or this industry at all is because of, of the togetherness. So um, it brings us together. So I think that's what we should start doing. So um, Chef, I, I love it. You said food is emotions bringing us together. And I'm just curious, every time you say that something should be there, does it always just show up without you having to do a thing? Because if that could happen in my world, I just saw the drinks just show up and I'm like, that's incredible how you pull that off. <laughs> yes. Um, I will tell you that I have a couple of crew in the background that are helping me out today. Um, but yes, uh, you know, in the kitchen, I would say that um, I, I do miss, you know, there are certain aspects of, of working in the kitchen that I do miss uh, from being on this side. There's a uh, little Jeff Yates right there. Mr. So. Yates is in the house. <laughs> oh, um, great. Yeah, but you, uh, you know, it is really just about kind of creating those things. So, um, you know, with with working in the kitchen, my favorite thing was always to to put something away dirty and then it become, you know, comes back to you clean. Um, and from when I first started in culinary school, you know, everybody used to always ask, well, who's the most important person in the kitchen? You know, and everybody, oh, the executive chef, the executive chef. And, you know, that's not true. It's a dishwasher. Um, yeah, so, sure. you know, I, I always love the fact that I could throw something dirty and bring it back and bring it back clean. So, um, but I, uh, yeah, so it's, you know, it's one of those things. So you just keep prepping the stuff up there, but you know, um, you know, the dishwashers are so important. So, um, heck yeah, that's awesome. You know, so, all right. Okay. We Where are we going to go? Here? Let's do it. All right. Yep. We're going to just start with going on a heat. We're going to do a little bit of a higher heat since you got a cast iron pan. It's going to take just a second longer for you to heat up. So go ahead and pop your pan on high. So a normal paella pan is a very thin metal, um, and it's just a regular carbon steel pan. So what does that mean? So you know, a carbon steel pan. You might hear the term high carbon steel. Um, they use that in knives, um, and basically it just means that uh, high carbon steel basically means that it's um, it's been infiltrated so that there is no wear. So the carbon is not going to de uh, de uh, de um, decompose or anything like that. So with this pan right here, because it's just a regular carbon steel pan, if there's any moisture in this pan, there's gonna be rust involved with this pan. So okay. it's really important that when I clean this pan that I you know, dry it, and then I'm gonna put a very, very, very thin layer of oil on this pan. Um, so that's, that's a little bit of care in, in the paella pan itself. Um, but the thinness of the pan is really part of the key. Um, that's why cast iron works so well too, because the thickness is actually going to retain the heat. So just like this pan is the thinness is actually just going to pass through the heat. We're going to do this kind of the same thing in a different way with the cast iron pan, because the whole key to paella is creating different textures. So we really want to create that bottom crunchiness. Um, with the soft rice on top. So that's really what we want to do, but we don't want to burn the bottom. So, um, okay. and that's kind of the little thing. So you got your pan started up here. I'm going to start mine up. Oh I'm yeah. On just a couple, um, Iwatani cassette foods on here. Um, Love it. So just let, let it heat up for a few moments here. I'm going to grab my, take your time. Um, my towel here. And then the first thing we're going to do is we're going to add a little bit of oil and we're going to saute some of our proteins. So we're going to do now, is our this chorizo. The four of is this the four tablespoons that you told me to get? Four tablespoons of olive oil. Exactly. And anytime with cooking, um, you can definitely measure is 100%. It really kind of however you feel your day is going, right? So, I mean, some people like to have, I, I want to do, you know, cooking. I want exactly, um, you know, the tablespoons and the teaspoons to the tea, the, to the grams. Or you can kind of just, you know, play around with it and add what you feel is the right amount. So, um, there is no wrong or right way to cook. It's just start doing it. All right. So, we're going to throw a little bit of oil in here. Okay. Just our four tablespoons. And then right away, I'm gonna start with our chicken. So this is just about two pounds of um, large diced chicken thighs. Yep. And we're gonna add right in there. And I like the chicken thighs for a couple different reasons. Um, we're going to get a better flavor out of the chicken thighs because there's more inherent fat in the chicken thighs. And then also the chicken thighs, can we can overcook them without them drying out. Cool, okay. All right, so we got that in there. And then right hey, after let me remind everybody, if you've got a question for Chef, throw it in the group. 
Uh, yeah. Oh, someone's saying hi. I can't see who it is, but someone's sending the love to you. That's awesome. Okay, yeah, so after the chicken. All right, so once the chicken just starts to brown, the next thing we're going to add right away is our chorizo. And chorizo is, there's a couple different types of chorizo. Um, there's the Spanish chorizo, which is going to be more of a, a cured chorizo. Um, and then you can also be known, uh, there's also the Mexican chorizo, which is a fresh chorizo. So this is the Spanish chorizo here. So you can kind of see it. Yeah. Cool. Lots of, that looks uh, great. Paprika, uh, pork, garlic. So we're just going to add that right into our pan. And the key, what we want to do, is we want to start to render some of the oil off of the chorizo. So we want to really start flavoring this right away. Um, could you add me some salt? And then right at this same at this same texture, what we're going to start doing is we're going to start layering flavors. Um, so we want to start adding salt and a little bit of pepper. At a little, it's just in layers at that point. Okay. How's it going over there? Is it it's starting, going. Is it start to be able to smell good there. Oh, it's smelling great, man. Perfect. Um, I'll zoom a little. Looking great, yeah. Okay, I got. I'm getting some salt and pepper. Yep, a little bit of pepper. Chorizo makes everything better. Yeah, I, I've yet to have a meal that involved chorizo that didn't um, didn't make me happier. Let's put it that way. You know, there is, uh, I used to work in, um, I was a saucier for about four years at a, a restaurant in Newport Beach called the Ritz Restaurant. And every morning at 11 o'clock, the dishwasher, the butcher would give the dishwasher meat and they would make tacos for us. And so um, most of the time it was some sort of, you know, they would, it would, we didn't have chorizo, but we'd add the flavors of chorizo in there. Yeah. Oh, um, and it, you know, it just brings back that, you know, just the flavors and, and beautifulness of it. So, and that's definitely one of those things. So we're getting a nice little sear on here. It's coming here. I'll show you mine in a minute. Yep. Um, Perfect. So you should see, you should start seeing some of the, you know, chorizo, the Spanish chorizo has a lot of paprika in it, okay. which is basically, you know, just a, a dried pepper uh, powder. Um, so you should start to see that kind of ooze out. Um, and then in Spain, they're they're really known for their smoked paprika, which we're going to be adding a little bit into the dish a little bit later. Um, oh, yeah. But perfect. We'll get this here. You're starting to get a little bit of color on your chicken. Yep, yep. It's starting. There's some that I need to move that over into the middle here. Yeah, it's, it's going to cook for a while, so it's not necessarily like let me uh, – you know, make sure every piece of chicken's done. I mean, once we put everything in there, it's gonna boil and stuff like that. So really what we're doing is just creating the, the, the base of flavor, right? Got we it. We wanna kind of create the, the my reaction, which is, you know, basically taking proteins and amino acids. Oh, and I'm burning my towel here. Turn that over. Um, <laughs> things that happen in the made... kitchen all the time. <laughs> oh yeah, man. Hey, what, tell, me, tell me what intrigued you. What made you want to become a chef? Oh, the million dollar question. Um, you know, that is, uh, interesting because it's, you know, for me, my, 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 well, some of my first memories as a, as a kid was always based in food. Um, originally being from New Orleans, um, you know, food, especially seafood was a huge part of, of everything that we did. Um, so I remember going, um, you know, to my uncle's houses and, you know, they would put the spread out with, you know, three pounds of crawfish and 30 pounds of shrimp and, you know, crabs and all this, you know, potatoes and mushrooms and corn. And it was always a good time, you know? So I just always associated food with a good time. Um, and then when I got a little bit older and we moved away from New Orleans and it was just me, my mom, my brother, my sister, um, it was a big Thanksgiving morning was probably <laughs> the number one thing for me because it was waking up early with my mom, um, at those times we put the turkey on like at six o'clock in the morning um, and just yeah. cooked it all day long. So you now you don't really need to do it this time. Um, but it was just about the, uh, you know, waking up with my mom, putting the turkey on, having the smells of, you know, the, uh, the, uh, the onions and the celery and the carrots. Um, it just always invoked those memories. So when I was uh, starting to think about what I wanted to do um, as a, you know, as a, you know, as an adult and what I wanted to do for a job, it constantly kept going back to food. It was always about, um, oh, I don't even want to do this, but I really love to cook. Oh, I love to do this. Oh, I really love to cook. And then it was, um, I was a junior in high school, 
and the food network had just kind of um, there, it was still it was just getting big, and there was this yeah. uh, an Emerald Lagasse article in the newspaper, um, you know, talking about him, and you know he's you know, originally from Massachusetts, but he lived in uh, New Orleans, and that's kind of where he's known for. Um, so he was saying, or in that article, that it said that he went to Johnson and Wales University, and so I kind of at that point was like, huh, Johnson and Wales, like maybe I could do that. I literally sent a letter to them um, just asking for information. I got yeah. an application in the mail. I sent the application away. I got accepted and I went. I had never cooked professionally before. Um, I, I worked at Staples in high school, so I'd never worked in the kitchen before. Um, I always loved to cook. You worked at Staples? I did. It was one of my first jobs. Yeah, that was my first job. I, I was a, a stalker, and then I went to and started uh, selling uh, business machines in their business machines. I can sell. It was nice. um, that's where I got my sales experience from. So uh, for this job. So. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but yeah, so uh, going back, like I just once I found out that he had gone to Johnson and Wales, I just something clicked in me, and I just went. I when I went to Miami. I went to the Miami campus. I had never. Like I said, never cooked in a kitchen before. I never even saw the school. I never even been to Miami before. It was like wow. this massive leap of faith. Um, in fact, my you know, we've seen us with growing up as a single mom. You know, we didn't have a lot of money, so my mom couldn't even like fly with me out there, um, which I know was super hard for her. Um, but I went, you know, I went to the other part of the country, didn't know anything about anything, um, but I literally found my passion. And uh, oh. it was the most amazing thing that I've ever done, um, or one of the most amazing thing. I would have to say my daughter is probably the most amazing thing, but um, it was one of those things that set me off and said, you know, when you when you start to kind of, you don't have to know everything, but yeah. when you um, trust in yourself, um, that's when the, the most amazing things happen, and you really just have to take yourself and, and just take that leap of faith right there. Um, Jeff, I think you said it perfectly. It's it's never about you. Never have to know how. The how always comes into place if you know what drives you, what your love is, and you're willing to go for it. We got some uh, people sending some love. Jeff Scott in action. Um, <laughs> someone saying your journey to being being a chef is a love story, Jeff Scott. How oh, wonderful yeah. to do what you love. Heck yes. Uh, it Shannon's is. Shannon's asking, are we both left-handed? Shannon, we are both left-handed, actually. We're in our right minds. <laughs> well played, yes. Uh, <laughs> camera does a mirror effect during filming. That's true. Scott, this smells unbelievable, by the way. Oh, my God. So now, so now, when now we rendered, now we're going to add some aromatics. So this is where you're going to add your bell peppers, your carrots, and your onions. So you can just go ahead and pop those suckers in. And we just did a Here. small dice on that, so like the carrots look like. Here, I'm going to show like you this, that. baby. Yeah. That's where we're Beautiful. at right now. Oh, yeah. Beautiful. So all three of those suckers in like that. You know, one of the the cool thing about paella, too, is it it is one of those things where when I first started off as a cook, um, you always are looking to what you can put stuff in, right? What can I add to this dish? What can I add? What can I add? You know, you're always adding stuff, which, you know, as you start cooking for years and years, um, I went through a phase where I was saying, well, if I add salt and pepper, or not necessarily salt, because salt, you don't really taste salt, but, um, you know, if I add pepper or garlic to everything, you know, does that make everything taste the same? So I went through a, a, a period where I stopped using black pepper, I stopped using garlic and, and what I add to, to kind of create those things. So um, as you as you start a journey as a cook and you're young, it's always kind of about what you add. And then as you get older, you start thinking about what can I take away or what, what don't I add? Um, yeah. And that's really what paella is about. Because, I mean, we're, we're talking, you know, there's eight, nine things in this. That's it. But they are, it's really about creating that stuff to where you have, you know, they build on each other. Um, and you create these amazing flavors that uh, you really wouldn't know all this stuff yeah. in there. So, so you got your you got your uh, your onions, your carrots, and your bell peppers in there. Done, done, perfect. We're gonna saute this for just another moment here. And when you're sautéing, it means that you got to hear some you got to hear some action from your pan, right? If your pan's not making any noise, you are not sautéing. That's so just great the feedback. Heat. Adjust the heat properly. I'm on two kind of cassette fuses here. So the, the big thing for us 
especially with a bigger pan, is that we want to try to make sure that we're cooking this evenly. So you'll notice that I keep turning the pan around. So as I get hot spots, I keep turning. That's going to be really important once we add the rice. Um, because once we add the rice and give it a stir, we are not going to touch this thing at all. And that's really part of the key um, to paella is knowing when to, tur when to stir and then when to kind of just walk away and let the paella, um, you know, kind of all the ingredients meet, meet themselves and, and kind of uh, create the flavor. Man, if that's not a life lesson, I don't know what is. Um, <laughs> someone's saying, beautiful, Jason, thanks for the love. Boom. Your pan is speaking to you, Shannon. Saying, "Heck yeah!" <laughs> I've never thought about the pan speaking to me. It's um, it's like Wilson. Um, it's true, right? But it's Lodge. <laughs> sometimes you talk to Wilson. Sometimes you talk to Lodge, Shannon. So when you're uh, when you when you cook professionally and you're on the line, you know one of the things that you do is um, you start using all of your senses. So huh. um, you know when I was I worked at the Montage Resort for for a while in Laguna Beach. And on uh, on a week a weekend day, you know, I'd have two people, you know, in my station. Um, so one was cooking, one was plating. But on the weekdays, when you're slow um, or slower, um, it would usually only be one person in that station. So I would have four or five pieces of fish, or so. I I always seem to be the fish cook or the seafood cook. I don't know why. Um, okay. But I would always have five or six pieces of fish in the back, and you, you turn to start plating, you start using your sense of hearing. And you could actually hear what this what the fish is doing. So you could, I would, I could be able to tell if my fish was starting to burn, or I didn't like the, the sound wow. of that flavor. So you really kind of encompass all of your senses when you're cooking. Um, and I, I think that's that's another allure for me because I mean, what other what other things where you're just so enamored with, you know, you're getting smells. And I keep lighting my thing on fire. This is like, sorry about that. But, uh, that's okay. You know, don't worry about it. It's, not, it's all about not freaking out on fire. Don't worry about that. Yeah. Multiple things. Multiple it's times. looking great, Chef. Someone's saying, so. guys, it looks so good. Chef, amazing story. Makes me want some wine and watch the paella episode of Seinfeld. <laughs> oh, yes. I have not seen that episode. I should watch that episode, actually. Um, all right. Now that we got this, let's add our garlic. And we're going to add our – we add our garlic a little bit later because – you know, when garlic starts to burn, we start to create some of those bitter notes. So we don't want that in there. So we're going to add our garlic now. And this is when you're really going to start to get a, a kind of a flavor boost or a smell boost from that. And then right after we add our garlic, now we're going to start to add some of our, our oh, spices yeah. and our aromatics. So we've got here, we've got some red pepper flakes and a little bit of Mexican oregano. Yep. Yep, and there's a couple differences. So Mexican oregano, why do they put? Why do they say Mexican oregano in front of it? There's two different types of oregano. Um, you've got the Mediterranean or Greek oregano, which is a, a more mild uh, flavor. It's it's a little bit more herbaceous. Um, it's not so in your face. The Mexican oregano is really pungent. So the more you use, um, you know, it really just kind of packs a punch. So. With this dish, with the chorizo and the spices and stuff like that, we really want to be able to have the oregano um, to have a stay. And if we were to use just the Greek oregano, it might get lost in the mix. So um, we're going to just sprinkle that on there. Oh, my gosh, Chef. Yeah, this is smells. smelling amazing. It's looking. Here you go, everybody. That's what we got so far. Yeah. Let me oh, show you man. here. I'll, let me pull, I'll pull mine off this for a second. You guys can see what we're, what we're looking like here. Oh, chef, that looks amazing, man. So, oh. bam. All right. So, moving forward, got this beautifulness here. And, I mean, the smells, and now you can really start to smell, you know, you're not just smelling carrots or garlic or onion. Now you're starting to smell the flavors really kind of start to mingle and, you know, and get introduced to each other. Um, you know, one of the, I think one of the things that also I love about cooking is, is that we just, we don't understand everything that happens. And that is huh. kind of a mystery. Like being from New Orleans, you know, um, I do gumbo for uh, Christmas Eve every year. And um, I used to make it on Christmas Eve um, because I was working in kitchens. I never had time to. And now when I'm, uh, I have a little bit more time and that time of year being, um, being a rep, I will make it the day before. And just, you know, just letting it sit. I really feel like when you when you have a spice mix or any type of that, 
you know, the cooling down and the reheat, the reheating process, because, you know, everything just melts together. You, you create these flavonoids that you would not have uh, huh. on the day of. It's just like having, you know, the soup. It's always better the next day. Um, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's yeah. a beautiful... That's kind of a funny story because my, what, about 10, well, 10 years ago this year, um, we were doing my, uh, my wife was uh, about 13 days, she was 12 days late um, waiting for our daughter to be born. And so uh, we had our uh, new Christmas Eve party like we always do. Uh, started up my gumbo, did all that stuff. It was, you know, had a great time. Um, my wife was like, you know, it was 12 days late, so we were scheduled to have a C-section on the 26th. So we're like, let's just have Christmas and we're going to have a baby. This is going to be amazing. Um, so we go to bed the night of Christmas Eve um, around 11 o'clock. About 1 o'clock in the morning, my wife wakes me up saying her water broke. And, oh, game. <laughs> um, I, it's time to go. So uh, I would like to say that the, the gumbo kind of uh, induced my wife into labor. And we had a Christmas baby because she was born at uh, 620 in the morning on Christmas Eve or Christmas oh, Day. Awesome. So, Congrats. What do they uh, say? Walking and, and spices, right? Uh, that's what it is. Yeah, so the spices got her uh, uh, on the gumbo for sure. So it's uh, yeah, but, uh, my daughter does not like spice. So. <laughs> we'll your daughter, that your daughter is 10? Uh, she's 10 this year. Yeah. Awesome, brother. So the other thing we're going to put in here is a little bit of our smoked paprika. Uh, yep. Were you able to get, were you able to find smoked paprika? Oh, Scott, was I able to find it? Right. Yes, sir. All right. There you go. So here's the, so you'll, smoked paprika is pretty easy to find nowadays. The one thing is that, so pe paprika is all about peppers, right? Dried peppers put into a powder. Um, if you're looking to do more authentic uh, paella, what you want to look for is something called bittersweet paprika. Huh. So oh, it's made yeah. by this elongated pepper. Uh, it's not really hot or mild. I'd say kind of medium. Um, and it just gives you kind of a, a little bit more of a, of a background note. It's got a little, it does have a little bit of bitterness to it. Um, so with the, with the sweetness from the, uh, the, the carrots and stuff like that, we're all, we're playing with all these flavors, right? When we eat the paella, we want our, our entire tongue to be involved with it. That's really the key. Because if you eat something and only part of your tongue is involved with it, that's when you start to kind of figure out, like, do I like this? Do I not like this? When your entire tongue huh. is involved, there is no reason that your, your, your brain is just saying, like, this is delicious. Oh, my God. So, um, all right. Moving on. Next, Jeff, I've never, gonna... I've never thought about some of this stuff, by the way. I love, I love getting to talk with you because I'm, I like just even the language. I mean, I've never even thought about my whole tongue experiencing something, frankly. So, you know, a meal. I love thinking about it that way. It's, it's the things that chefs think about. You know, yeah. when I was a uh, when I was a saucier for four years, you know, I did soup, sauces, and braised meat. Um, wow! You know, so you can you can you can just run through that process really quickly, or you can start to think about, you know, what do I want to do, and how do I create this and, and make it better? Um, because one, like, here's the cool thing about cooking that I really enjoy, um, and maybe it's because I'm a Leo and I, I like to control things. But the way that you cut things and the way that you put things in order and cook them. Um, even the way that you put a sandwich together, um, the order that you put the ingredients on is going to affect how somebody experiences that food. So, um, you know, if you if you have, you know, an awesome, you know, BLT and they take a bite and you don't have bacon in that portion of the sandwich, you know, you've left huh. something there. You know, yeah. but if, if you've got the bacon and this lovely tomato and the tomato is salted and maybe there's a little bit of acidity with the tomato, so you're really kind of involving all those things, you know, there's, you know, that's when the magic can really happen. All right. So now we're going to talk about um, putting in some, a little bit of tomato product here. Um, I got a little 28 ounce can of some uh, central tomatoes. They're just diced tomatoes. Anything yep. like that? Something like that. Yep. Uh, we can just go ahead and, and throw these suckers in. And this is going to give us basically just a little bit of our base in our body. And then right after that, we're going to throw our rice in. And Sweet. So right. That is kind of the key, right? Because it is a rice dish. So what kind of rice we use is obviously going to be how we uh, – how we um, interpret these flavors. So we're going to use a short grain rice. So most short grain rices are 
I should say all short grain radishes are not made the same or, or grown the same, but they can be used kind of interchangeably. So uh, I've got here is just a, a Spanish bumble rice, which is yep. just a regular short grain rice. You can use a sushi rice, a cow rose rice, and you're going to see here just a, a short grain. Oh, yeah. Yep. Um, and basically at that point, we're just going to sprinkle it. Actually, if, when you're in Spain, I should tell you this. They actually do in Spain, the biggest thing when they do this is they actually make a cross. So they'll take the oh. rice and make a cross with their rice. No way. So it's very, um, yep, they, they, uh, very symbolic, you know, I guess. Huh? Very symbolic. It's just, you know, just part of the kind of the ritual of making paella. Um, at this point, once we throw the rice in there, we're going to throw a little bit more salt in there. Where's the salt there? No, it's salt. Yeah, right? I'm looking for, <laughs> not looking for that one. Uh, and it's really, when you're doing, when you're cooking like this, it's, it's super important. You never want to taste the salt in a dish. If you huh. taste the salt, you've salted it too much. Um, but how you salt and when you salt is really important. So if you salt only at the end of your dish, you're going to taste the salt. The, um, you know, nothing has been able to absorb the salt. Um, so that way it's just right at the front of your tongue. So by adding a little bit of salt here and there, um, we are able to build the layers and then now we're going to season our food. We're not trying to make it salty. So now Man, once you I... got all this in there, yeah, you're good. So now it's gonna start to get thick, right? Oh, the yeah. The key is we can turn turn the heat down just a tiny bit until you get, um, until you get, uh, we just basically want to coat the rice with a little bit of seasoning. We want to make sure that the rice is all kind of coated with the oil so that way we get a little bit of, uh, we don't get too sticky of a product here. And then we're going to move into our stock. And the, what I like to do um, is take our saffron. I don't know how many people have ever worked with saffron before, but it's, we actually have Steve oh, Saffron yeah. here, who the namesake is. Um, but saffron's one of those things where, you know, it's, um, it's kind of elusive. Um, yeah. It's actually the world's most expensive spice. But the key is, is that it's the most expensive spice to purchase, but you don't use a lot of it. So it's not a lot to use it in your dishes. Um, what I've got here, I think I purchased this thing. It was about 10 bucks. Um, I used about half of it. So, I mean, it's five bucks. It's definitely, it's a good amount. Um, saffron is actually the stymen of what's the purple crocus flower. And huh. it's this really kind of crazy plant. Um, they grow uh, probably the most in like Morocco. And it's a very, very small plant. It's got a couple leaves on it. And this really, really big flower that's much bigger than the plant itself. Um, huh. And it has three little stamens in it. So each flower has three stamens. So Does that look exactly. good, Chef? Is that about how much I yep. want to throw in? Yeah, throw that into your stock. Or you can throw it right into your rice too, ma'am, either way. Oh, 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 into the chicken stock, right. are you saying? Gotcha. Yeah, you can do it either way. <laughs> All right, we're just going to do it. We're running with it. We're um, running with it. Yeah, I, rice up, bam. Um, so the, the stamens in here, so you get three stamens for, per flower. So in order to make one pound of saffron, you need 35,000 flowers. So that's why it is so expensive. So uh, I, I almost told also, you last night when I was at the grocery store shop and I was going to be like, Scott, I think it's less expensive to get marijuana in Colorado yeah. than saffron. It probably is. It probably <laughs> is. Um, in fact, back in ancient times, they wouldn't even use it for a spice. They actually used it for the color. So they use it as a dye. So they would, they would dye like the royal, uh, the royal, um, you know, garbs in, in the saffron. So I just put my saffron into the, into uh, some chicken stock. Yep. And then I'm just going to add my chicken stock to my pan. So you can add your chicken stock to your pan now. Man, I hope I, my pan is big enough for all this. We're about to find put out. In, I'll tell you that. Yeah. If you can't take all the stock, you're okay. Cause part of, part of the reason that, so we're, we're doing about two and a half cups of rice to eight cups of chicken stock. And if you look at the ratio, that's quite a bit more than what a normal rice would be. Like a normal rice, you would do about maybe one part rice to two parts water. Mm -hmm. um, but the reason why we're doing one to four is because we have a huge surface area here and we're not covering it. So 
So normally with rice, you're going to cover it. It's going to, uh, the, the steam is going to condensate, go back into the pan. So it's going, it's not going to lose so much water. Um, yep. With this, because we're not going to cover it, we're going to lose a lot of water to evaporation. But that's okay because we've adjusted to that with the, uh, the, the stock itself. So now cool. I've, got my, I've got my burner back on. And all I'm doing is kind of just moving the rice around, just trying to get it kind of all settled. Yep. Just trying to get it all settled, kind of, you know, make it all kind of even and this or that. And then we just want to start kind of get it. At that point, you can add uh, your bay leaves. I actually forgot my bay leaves. Um, so oh, I wish uh, I could give you one. I know, I actually have a, I have a laurel tree in my house. I have no reason why I don't have a bay leaf. Uh, but uh, throw the bay leaves in there. The cool thing about bay leaves too, same thing with like oregano, there's two types of bay leaves. So you've got like the sweet California bay leaf um, or you've got a Mediterranean bay leaf. Mediterranean bay leaves are, are really intense. Um, so like a half a leaf can sometimes just be overpowering. The sweet bay or the laurel tree is what we use uh, mostly in culinary or it's considered the culinary bay. Um, and it's, it's just one of those um, delicious flavors. If you don't know what bay uh, like a bay leaf does in flavoring, um, I would suggest doing beans. Because if you take beans, um, like dried beans and cook one, like uh, you know, pound of bay, a pound of dried beans with a bay leaf or two and one without, you will fully understand what the bay leaf is bringing to the table. It is really about like background um, notes and, wow. and bringing up that kind of your palate on the, on the back end. So that way you kind of taste, you know, more of the nuttiness of the, of the beans and stuff like that. So um, it is, uh, it is just one of those kind of crazy things. I, I always, I love to hear the history of all this stuff. Cause who was the first person to, you know, put a bay leaf in food? You know, who was the first person to eat an oyster or a clam? I mean, those are, yeah. That's what really gets me excited about food because, um, you know, we all need to eat. Um, it's, it's probably the uh, most, um, you know, intimate thing you can do for, to somebody uh, in a public setting where you can, you know, you're feeding somebody, you're, you're, you're giving them energy for their, you know, for them to live. So it's really, really just about that. So it's about putting in the good energy and, um, and creating that and you know that's that's what this is all about so you can see now that um you're probably starting to get a little bit of steam kind of coming off your pan yeah um, feel free to kind of move your pan around a little bit you, the one thing you don't want to do is touch the rice anymore oh so get that get that spoon out of there there you go got it okay that's the key that is the number one thing so you know um don't touch when the you're rice. when you're thinking about cooking you know your ingredients pay, play a huge portion in what you do, right? Because you're never going to make something better than what it starts off to be um, or the quality of that. But, you know, technique plays such a huge key in cooking um, in that sense. So that's really where kind of coming in here. So, so, you know, with paella, once you've added the stuff in there, you don't want to touch it at all. You literally want the, the rice to just absorb what's going on in here and then kind of bring it down um, and then absorb it all in there. And then we'll throw some... Um, in fact, I got to grab out in the van and grab some of, of the peas and some other stuff at, towards the end when it gets there. But um, yeah, at this point for me, I'm just going to kind of keep, I kind of see that I got some bubbles coming over here, but I don't got too much going on over here. So I'm just going to keep turning it um, and keep turning it until basically all the water is absorbed. It takes about 20 minutes. Um, it's not a ton of time. So right around the same amount of time that you would do with uh, a normal um, rice dish. Um, and at that point we will kind of create all those flavors. And now we're just, you know, all those flavors that we created are now absorbing in the rice, which is um, what we're looking for. Scott, I got to tell you, man, your your heart and your passion, and I mean, just the way you talk about your art, your art form, your craft, it is uh, it is like on your sleeve, man. It is so evident and beautiful. And it's clear that it's so much more than about the food, that there is a message, there's a spirit, there's a heart behind all of it in what you're offering from, from you as the chef to your guests who partake. I mean, it's just so much bigger. I, you know, I, 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 I totally agree with you. Cause that's, I mean, I think that's kind of who I am in that sense. I mean, it's, it's, um, I'm a super passionate person. I think that, you know, passion is, uh, I used to tell my cooks, um, or when I was hiring somebody when, in, in kitchens and stuff like that, I can teach you everything, but I can't teach you passion. So if you come to me with passion, I, you know, as much passion as you have as, as, as far as it's going to take you, 
Um, I can teach you how to cook. I can teach you everything. I can teach you to manage people. I can teach you all this stuff. But if you don't have the passion, um, you know, that's, that's the drive, right? That's the drive that, that yep. makes you work that extra time or do that extra step. And, and uh, you know, it's, it's, it's probably one of the most human things, I think, because it, it just makes you feel alive. You know, it's like yeah. every day it can be so different, um, you know, especially in the cooking world or especially in the world that we live in now, you know, it's, um, but, you know, it's finding those things throughout the day um, and having a good meal um, is, is one of those things that people, you know, kind of universally just love to do. And um, yeah, it's, it is just one of the, I just, it is hands down my favorite thing to do in the world. Uh, is cook. <laughs> so. Oh, I love it. You know what passion is? I, I think of it like a, um, like I'm a, I, I see everything. I, um, my words turn into images in my head and I see mm -hmm. almost like a flame inside someone. Right. And there's times where you're, you find your passion about someone, you find your joy or about something your joy sparks, you get excited, you wake up early in the morning because you can't sleep because you're so fired up to create something new and you stay up late to dream about what's next. And that flame is just huge inside. And then there's times where people are lacking passion and that energy and that flame is small. And I think one of the goals is to go around and search for that thing that you love that brings that joy, that spark, you know, that flame to grow. And I love that it was, you know, that it's cooking for you. That just makes me smile. It was, um, you know, it was, I had a, uh, I have a really good friend who, um, you know, didn't necessarily know, I'm trying to find out how I can, oh, I got to do like this. Um, you know, didn't necessarily know where, I guess, he was going in life. Um, yeah. You know, uh, which I guess, you know, we were all there before. And I remember, because oh, yeah. I, li I lived next door to him. We lived in Costa Mesa, and we, um, my buddies owned a fourplex of four individual houses, and I lived in the first house, he lived in the second house. I remember having a conversation with him. Um, and him, him telling me, he's like, you know, I, you're so lucky because you just know what you want to do. Like, you know, you want to do it, blah, blah, blah. Like you just set off and, you know, it, it took me back because at first I was like, what are, what are you talking about? I know what I wanted to do. Like I, you know, every day is a challenge and you just continually just, um, you know, you just kind of find the courage and keep moving on. And, um, but to me that it, for what I, with my passion to go through that, you know, working all those hours and working that stuff. For him to see that as wow, it just looks so easy for you. Um, it took me back because I was like, man, I have been working hard for so yeah. many years. What are you talking about? It came easy. Um, but when he saw it, you know, he saw it as it's just so easy, um, yeah. which is completely not what it was. But uh, you know, perspective is 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 definitely uh, is one thing on that. But it's um, you, know, you you have to take a chance. You know what I mean? Like I don't I would not be where I was at if um, I didn't at that you know computer table take a chance and say you know what I'm gonna go and do this. Um, it was it was super scary. I remember being on the plane going like what am I you know what am I doing? And then I used to uh, at my school I used to do a lot of uh, volunteer work. And so yeah. we do these um, these things called chef choices where one of the one of the chefs and we have the public come in and we do like a cooking class with the chefs um, with the with the with the public and. There'd be one uh, chef instructor and, you know, one or two students. And I remember afterwards, um, I would probably have been in school for maybe about nine months at that time. And um, he was my, uh, Chef Hensley was my, one of my mentor chefs. Uh, if, I, if I could have half his career, I would have, um, be amazed. But I remember sitting down after the class and telling him kind of the story that I was just telling you about, you know, wanting to know what I, what I was doing and, you know, was this right, the right thing? I kind of told him this whole story. I said, hey, I took the leap of faith. Like, I don't know if it was the right, right choice for me. And uh, he turned to me and said, it was 100% the right choice. And that, I'm going to choke up a little bit because that was the, um, that was basically somebody saying like, no, you, you've done it. You know, you, you went down the right path. And uh, it's, it's, it, it still chokes me up because it's, it's just one of those things where you just, I never knew, like, you know, we so innocently went into that room and, ha and we're having yeah. dinner afterwards. Um, and to, to bring you back to that, say, wow, you know, all these life choices that you've made in your life, like, you know, kind of, you know, says, hey, you did the, you made the right choices. It was huge. It was a really big thing for me. So um, when, I, when I have a hard day, I always remember th those times because that is, uh, those are the, the hard times are what make you the good times good. So it's, um, and now we, you know, we have, we're making paella together. I mean, this is beautiful. 
<laughs> Jeff, it's awesome. I, I, you know what? I, I'll say thank you. Thanks for taking a risk. Thanks for following your heart. Thanks for trying something that was scary. And um, you know, you know what, man? I'm, I don't know. I'm proud of you. And and we all get to be better. And we all get lifted up by your example. By the way, thank you to for to whoever said I haven't turned the pan. I've been turning the pan, and I'm watching you tattoo. I'm trying to turn that pan more. Um, but um, y- you know what? If to anyone out there listening to Scott right now and saying, gosh, I wish I knew what my passion was. Um, you know, passion is a, is a, a key component of, uh, of that flame, right? And I would just say, start with this. It's like an internal GPS system. You know, GPS, right? We, we type in a destination, right? And we hit go and it, it gets us there. Your destination is joy. Let's just start there. What, what makes you come alive, right? What is that thing that's, that gets you excited, gets you fired up, that you're like, oh my gosh, I could do this and not sleep, or I could do this. What would you, here's another way to ask it. If you didn't need to make money, what would you be doing with your time? What would bring you joy if money wasn't an option? And it's not like you, you know, if that's something other than what you're doing right now, it's not like you go quit and you go do that, but you just start finding ways to develop that and, you know, build that muscle. It's like a muscle. Um, that you, you practice and Scott took a risk and he dove in and he worked hard and he cultivated that flame inside. And, and you know, there's beautiful things that happen for him and his team and our community as well, because he chose to do it. There was a great quote by a guy named St. Irenaeus, I think. It's one of my favorite quotes of all time. It said, don't ask what the world needs. Ask what makes you come alive and do that. Because what the world needs is more people who have come alive. And um, Scott is a Beautiful example of that for our community, for sure. I'm still turning here, Scott. I don't know if it's going good or not, but I'm turning, baby. It's just going to take some time. It depends on how hot your stock was. You know, if you you start with hot stock, it could be, you know, 20, 25 minutes. It might take a tiny bit longer with that, uh, without the stock, but it will get there. And that's kind of the thing is you you kind of trust the process Um, as you're turning and, and, and trust your senses. You know, if you hear... If you start hearing sounds and it's starting to dry out and you start smelling something, you know, those are, those are signs that you, you need to turn the pan, turn it down. You know, those are, uh, those are real, uh, real now markers I'm, in the room. I'm, right I'm boiling a lot. Can you see that? Is that yeah. all right? No, I'm going to come here. And... Yeah, it's perfect. Just keep it going. Okay. You can move it out. Are you boiling most, mostly in the middle? Well, I can't figure out how to get this induction. Yes. Most of it's in the middle, Jeff. So you can just move the pan around the induction flame, like kind of, you know, take the pan and just move it a little bit to the side of it. See, induction is going to be a little bit weird because it's going to be where the magnet is. Um, yep. But it'll still work. It's still going to work because the heat's still in the middle. It's still transferring out to the hot side. And that's where the, the cast iron is going to uh, do well for you. It's going to a little bit of an insurance policy because it retains heat so well um, that you'll be able to kind of, um, you know, that's what cooking's all about. I mean, most of the things that we enjoy in cooking were mistakes. So if you're not used to making mistakes, that's another thing I used to tell my cooks all the time was, hey, look to me as the executive chef is I'm the one that's made the most mistakes, but I've learned yeah. from my mistakes. So it's not just about making the mistakes, it's about learning from them. Don't do them again, you know, critically think about it. So, you know, when we were, um, one of my favorite things in culinary school was when somebody would mess up. Because the entire kitchen would stop, you know, and um, it was funny. I remember in, in, in stocks and sauces being from New Orleans, you know, I made ruse. I was stirring ruse when the, you know, before I could even like reach the counter with, you know, stepping on a stool and ruse just basically flour and, and some sort of fat um, to, as a thinking agent for like gumbos and stuff like that. Um, but I remember somebody burnt the roux and they stopped the class and because they were going to take that roux and they were going to add it to all of these other vegetables that they've already sauteed and you know all this other work was done. So if they would yeah. not have realized that, hey, I burnt this roux and added it to that, then they've created more mess, right? They've, they've not only did they burn the roux, now they have to rechop all the vegetables and all those things. So it, it is about, you know, being kind of in the moment and the things and yeah, you know, I mean, we all, it's, there are just so many things in life that get you kind of out there. And I love, that's the one thing. I mean, cooking, you can make metaphors for anything. <laughs> That's kind of yeah, what I love sure. about it. Uh, and what I, you know, one of the other things that I love about cooking is um, you can do things. I've made paella probably, I don't know, a hundred times. 
and I will constantly learn something new about it. Mm. You know, I've made I've made omelets a thousand times, you know, or more, and you can mess it up and learn something new about it. So it, you know, as much as you know, you could be a three Michelin star chef or whatever. And it bring you right back to, you know, wow, I, it's like my first day in culinary school or, or my first day in the kitchen. And um, that's, that's really kind of the fun part about cooking this because it's, it is, you know, it's visual. It's, 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 it makes you feel alive, you know, and it can also burn you and cut you. So you, you really <laughs> feel it, <laughs> which I've done plenty of that as well. So, <laughs> uh, well, that's all a part of the process, isn't it? Um, yes. Y- you know, it's, don't don't expect to try something new and not take a few dings along the way and not get a few bruises, and that's okay. Uh, people need to realize that that's just a part of it. You don't when you know when something happens, you don't give up. Don't even call it failure. Just simply call it. You know what? It's a course correction. I learned something that didn't work. I think it was Edison yep. that said, you know, I never failed. I just found ten thousand ways that didn't work to create a light bulb. Um, yeah. you, you know, so get that word failure out or just re-perceive it. Um, I, I talked to, oh no, I listened to the other day an interview with the woman that created Spanx. Yeah. And um, I don't wear Spanx personally and I don't even understand what they do other than I think I, you put them like under your pants or something like that. But, um, but she said that her dad used to come home and at least once a week, like after school, they'd come, he'd come home for dinner and he would ask her at least once a week, hey, how'd you fail this week? And failure became a positive thing he and if she didn't have something she had failed at he'd be like you're not trying new enough new things you're not you're not trying your hand at stuff i want you to be failing at things because that means you're putting yourself out there it means you're trying something new it means you're cultivating and developing a a skill or a talent that you haven't tried before so go fail at something would you um i i totally agree one of my favorite saints and I, i'm i don't know who said this and it's definitely not mine um but um, it's it's kind of a, a quote where you know luck equals preparedness plus opportunity. So when you're prepared to see the opportunities, that's when you're able to grab them. And the only way you're able to do that is really to kind of have focus and, and really kind of see you know those things. So I mean, just like my friend was saying, wow, you're lucky. You know, you know what you want to do with your life. Um, I didn't see it like that. Yeah. I saw it as this huge journey where I was, you know, working nights and weekends and holidays when all my buddies were, you know, going out and having fun and all this other stuff. And I was working, you know, 12, 14 hours a day. I didn't, I didn't see that as, you know, wow, this is me, you know, journey. It's like, I, I, you know, they were having fun. They were this, and it was, um, you don't really know where you go. You know what I mean? You don't know where, you know, you don't know where you, when you start, you don't know where it's going to end. Um, yep. But the, it's just kind of like life, right? I mean, life is not the beginning or the end. It's it's the journey that you you know. It's every moment, and that's and it's the times where you can take and take that step back and be like, wow, look where I'm at. Um, yes. Those are probably my favorite times in life. Um, I do it more often with my daughter than anything because I'm I'm constantly trying to um, grab that that time. Um, you know, I grew up with a single single mom. My dad was not in my life at all. So when I had, you know, when I got married, I'm like, hey, we're having a daughter. It's like, I want to be a part of her life. I want to, you know, do the things that, you know, dads do. That I, or at least yeah. that I thought that dads do. Um, and part of that was, and that, and that's part of the reason why I kind of left the kitchen. Um, even mm. though, so my, before this, I was the corporate executive chef at the Federal Reserve Bank before I went to go work for Jeff. Um, and even though it, it was, you know, we doing, you know, cafe in the morning, we were doing a thousand people, you know, scratch cooking in the morning. We did so much um, dinners and stuff like that. So I was working these really long hours. Um, and I did not want to, um, I didn't want to miss the time with my daughter. Yeah. You know, you don't, you don't get that time back. And that's probably for me, it was like, you know, I can be in the kitchen. I can do all this other stuff later. Um, but, you know, I'm only going to be the top of her, of her world for the next couple of years. Um, and now yeah. it's fading even at 10. Um, you know, so it's like, I, I don't want to have, I don't like the word regret per se, but it's, um, you know, I don't want to look back and think I should have done something differently. Um, yeah. you know, cause, uh, inaction for me is not necessarily an option because I've just seen the times that when, in, at least in my life where the times that you, you actually do something 
um, no matter what it is, it's creating that positive energy and, and the, the positive results come from that. You know, it's always been the, the harder I work, the better it's been for me. Um, so it's, it's, it's definitely, um, yeah, it's, it's, uh, life is interesting like that for sure. <laughs> The perspectives come all the time. <laughs> I love your messaging and I mean, you're preaching. This is incredible. I, I you know, you, you, you call it a, a side gig as a, as a food service power plant preacher because you're bringing it. I love it. Okay, now here, I got a, I got a culinary question because someone says here, for the love of God, get Shannon in there, my wife, before he burns it. So this is a genuine question I have. There's a lot of liquid in here. We're boiling. Yeah. Can I burn this right now? Not necessarily. No, not with the liquid, but you can. So what will happen with this? So you can see, so it's all about the, so this is where um, understanding the food is really key. So um, the other reason, uh, so I used to watch a lot of cooking shows when I was a kid, um, uh -huh. like the frugal gourmet and um, galloping gourmet and all these ones. And I would watch the show and then I would go into the, my kitchen um, at my house and I would, pretend and, and play to the cabinets and have this cooking show. Uh, and one of the things that they always did at the cooking show was that they, you know, they're, they would always have these kind of like, um, you know, replacements, right? So they, they put a cake in and they take the cake out. Um, and I, obviously I couldn't do that when I was, you know, working at, uh, doing this in my kitchen. So I would literally, you know, like talk to it and take a break. Say, oh, we're going to commercial. And then I would put the, the, the cake in the oven. I would sit and watch the cake bake for the entire 45 minutes. Like just <laughs> staring at the oven and watching the batter react. I, and I, I, I mean, it's, <laughs> I mean, I don't know, uh, you could say a whole bunch of stuff about that, but you know, for me, what it actually ended up doing was that, you know, I can see, like I can watch it, I can see a cake baking and I can know where it's at in that, you know, cause you just, yeah. you get that kind of like understanding about it. So. But I was saying when you get back to here, you notice that when we first put the liquid in and it was kind of like boiling away, as it's as the liquid starts to go down, the bubbles are going to get bigger. So that okay. you know that okay, we're starting to get we're starting to get some um, some absorption in there. So when the bubbles start to get bigger, um, that means that you know you're basically the heat's coming up there. It's it's boiling away. So when when the water boils away, there's a dry part in that cooking so you could start to burn at that point so that's when when you start to see the bigger bubbles you can actually back down on the heat a little bit okay and then that's going to give you a little bit more insurance so you can kind of start off at like a medium high and then just slowly kind of go um right at the end when this is kind of done and we kind of we want to we want to hear some like hissing sounds because that's when we're going to create that kind of crispy crust with the smoke rats. um that's when we're going to um We'll turn it up a little bit and then we'll just let it rest for a second. But you can see here, I've got some really big bubbles going on over here. And I just kind of keep turning it and going, but it's definitely getting much thicker. We're probably about five or 10 minutes away from here. Oh, I love um, it. Um, but, Scott, and, you, you said yep. something, by the way, I'm going to tee off on. Um, you, you talked about you used to watch a cooking show and you would go into your kitchen and you would start doing it. You started living it. And yes. there's this there's this principle and a lot of the stuff I've learned through a lot of like the Canfield stuff and that that like we talk about in the group and it's called acting as if like a key component mm -hmm. to moving forward in your dreams is acting now as if you are already in that place. So Scott's watching these cooking shows and these people doing this stuff and he goes into his kitchen, he starts acting as if he were that person. And you're you're starting to feel the things that they feel and think the things that they think. And it's a a really key component of moving forward in whatever dream you have is figuring out what that dream is, what would they be doing right now and go act it out, go pretend that you're, you know, all of those things. And I think, I, I mean, I love that you did that. And I mean, just beautiful. It's great. Um, yeah, it was, I, you know, for me, it was, I just, cooking was always crazy. I, I remember one thing was um, salsa, like pico de gallo salsa. It was like, I didn't understand how you could just like the tomatoes and onions and put it in a bowl and it tastes like salsa as a kid. Yeah. I just didn't understand it. And so I, I was like, what do you mean? You just put it. I remember the first time I ever made salsa, I used vinegar. I didn't even have like citrus or anything or a lemon or, any, or, or lime and put it in there. And I remember I would just keep tasting it. I tasted it every, every like, I don't know, maybe every minute. And at first I'm like, this is horrible. It tastes like 
<laughs> vinegar with like, you know, I get this texture of the tomato, but I'm not even tasting the tomato. Um, and then slowly but surely, I remember tasting it. I mean, like, oh, vinegar, oh, vinegar. And then the next time I tasted it, it didn't taste like vinegar anymore. It, uh, it changed in that little second, that moment from the two tastes. And then I was like, wait a second, is my, am, I, am I not tasting this correctly now? Or did this actually change? Um, you know, so it's all kind of, you know, it, it, it is just, you know, for me, it's, it's, um, it's kind of a miracle in, in cooking. You know, you create these different things and um, I, it, it still just, it awes me. I, I just, um, even though I know how most of the stuff works, um, it just literally, I, I'm like a kid in the candy store. Um, oh, like my, one of my favorite things to do is like cook with my daughter on, um, she likes to bake. She's not a big cooker or a big cooker, a big, a big, uh, savory, uh, cook. Um, although yep. she does do dinners and stuff like that. Um, she'll make like pizza and stuff like that, but, uh, um, baking is really, she loves any type of it. She's like a, she's like a sweets person, but, um, she, I'm trying to like spark that in her. And uh, yeah. when I when I uh, when we made cinnamon rolls, I saw that kind of spark because she was kind of like she she's kind of saw it made and she did this and then there was that that moment when she saw it being rolled and cut when I was like wow it changed you know it turned into something different like that moment it changed um, and it, you know it's just it, it just kind of been odd to me. I, you know, maybe I'm, I'm I'm a pretty simple person I guess but you know the little things in life I think are just kind of crazy and, you know just you know, um, like I say, cooking and the science of cooking just is one of those things where um, I Jeff, just it's, it's, get uh, over it. You, what did, what did uh, our buddy Rob Connolly, he's the president of Henny Penny and Napham currently, he said on, when he came on the podcast, he said, um, curiosity, or maybe, actually it might have been another night, but he said, curiosity is the fountain of youth. And that curiosity, apparently my wife is totally unbelieving in what I'm doing. She thinks I'm burning it. Babe, do you smell something that I don't? Just keep turning it around. So now you'll see. So here, I can show you that. So I'll show you this here. Oh, goodness gracious. That looks good. So see how over here it's a little bit more wet? Yeah. I got bubbles over here, but I don't have bubbles over here. Yep. So just keep turning it to where it's wet. You, you're, it's a little bit different because you're, you've got induction. Um, here, I'll show you this, baby. Let me see. Yeah. Just keep going. Okay. Yeah, the, okay. All, the, the, the only reason why you're a little bit behind me is because you don't have the surface area that I have. You've got more depth and less surface area, so you're just a tad bit behind me, but you're, you're right there. You're right there. And I'm like, I, I, I got to tell you, like, for whatever reason, and obviously I don't cook a ton, but I want to have, like, I always want to be moving the food around, and you told me not to touch the rice, and the first thing I think is, do you ever see Arrested Development? Yes. Not touching. I'm not touching. Remember, no touching in prison. Scott, no touching. Um, <laughs> that's the first thing that comes to my mind is I'm like watching this and I'm so tempted to just move it around, but I'm not. And I see the rice growing and rising to the top. You're right. That liquid, well, that's rising to the top because the liquid's going down. Yep. You know, and, and cooking, it's so, everybody wants to think, oh, I'm stirring, I'm sauteing, I'm, I'm moving, all this other stuff. That's where the technique part comes in, right? Where you understanding those processes and saying, okay, well, you know, moving that at this point is great, but once I put it in here, you know, what am I trying to do? And you'll, you'll see it. If you were actually to, to make this again and move the rice around, what you'll find is that the texture of the rice is going to be way different. So just like a risotto um, where you, you're actually wanting to move the rice around, right? So the, yeah. the whole part of risotto is, so we're using risotto is a short grain rice. This is a short grain rice. What's the difference, right? is risotto we're looking for that creaminess and risotto you're going to use a rice like a, a borio or a, a carinari where um actually provide uh, prefer the carinari because it absorbs water a little bit more evenly um huh. but the aborio rice which is what everybody else uses um absorbs water just a little bit slower but the key part of the risotto is that you keep stirring it so as the rice absorbs the water you're actually stirring off that starch in the rice huh. to create the creaminess. That's why you're doing huh. it. We don't want to create the creaminess here. We want to keep the starch in the in the grain. So if you were to keep stirring this, you would actually see that you would get more creaminess out of it. You would kind of leach the starches out. In this rice, it will also make it a little bit more gummy in that sense because we don't, we're not going to keep adding liquid like you would do with risotto. Um, 
but yeah, so that's those are those are how you're adding those different same ingredient, different techniques create different things. In that so sense. rad. Ooh. I've never thought about this stuff, Chef. It's amazing. Uh, real quick, Shannon, my wife, I'm going to ask you if you can bring some headphones out. I don't see any. My AirPods might die. It says they're at 10%. So we'll see. Uh, babe, I love you. You rock. Um, okay. We're still moving this. Still moving. Just keep turning it around there. Oh, yeah. At this point, oh, yeah. you can just see, like, it's just going to absorb. It's just going to be beautiful. You can throw your peas on right now if you've got your peas. I forgot to take the peas out. Here we go. Let's go to the freezer. We're going to the freezer. My peas are in the van, so I'm going to uh, go to the peas today. <laughs> we were, we have, uh, with Rationale, we have a, um, a unit in a mobile sprinter van, um, fully self-contained. So we were out at a uh, Casa de Tempo golf club today in, in Santa Cruz in a beautiful day. It was like 65 degrees, sunny. Uh, oh. Yeah, it was... <laughs> Awesome. So the reason why you live in California. So we, we can't take pictures of those days and send them off to people because you know we don't we don't get the kind of reactions that we're looking for. People it's are like, like what's when wrong I, with you? I know it's like when I used to travel and like first when we, like we were married having kids and I would travel I'd send pictures hand in pictures of like great meals I was having and she's yeah. like you do understand that it's like mac and cheese and chicken nugget night again here <laughs> stop sending pictures. Uh, that is, that's my wife as well. <laughs> okay, how many peas, Scott? How much peas? I'm gonna just gonna feel um, this one. I'm not even gonna measure it. I'm going rogue. No more than 152. Then a what? I'm just joking. I'm just joking. <laughs> whatever, <laughs> exactly. whatever you want. Count right, out, gonna... 100. You want 152 peas? 100, 152 peas. Yep, yep. Yeah. <laughs> we just... nailed it. That looks good. That looks good. Sprinkle them around. You can move them around a little bit. And then the you mean with the spoon? that's coming off of them? Yeah. Oh, yeah, man, we're going back around. with the spoon. We're not touching not, it yet. Okay. Not just the, just the top. Just the top. Just the top. Just kind of sprinkle it around a little bit. Oh, yeah. Perfect. Now, now you're done. Done. No <laughs> touching. <laughs> no touching. <laughs> <laughs> Your touching oh, tongue is me, over. Get oh. me an ice cream sandwich. I feel like that's that guy. Like He was always eating ice cream sandwich in prison. So you can see now that we've got, so I'll show you here. Oh gosh. Heck so we've got almost, yes. almost absorbed fully here. That is and then beautiful. We put some, so normally, you know, peas. Um, so this is, you know, what's funny about paella is that most people think of paella as like this, you know, the classic kind of, you know, national dish of Spain. Um, which most people think of, unless you ask somebody from Spain or Spaniard, they will say that paella comes from the Valencian region of Spain. It's it's Valencian, uh, so that's huh. if you know. So it's very interesting. So each region of Spain has kind of a, um, its own kind of paella, although Valencia kind of owns the paella. Um, this is more of a Valencian paella because we didn't use a lot of seafood. They're more inland, so they would be using stuff like um, you know. The, if they're if they're tending to their flock or this or that, so they would start a fire, get the pan out, you know, maybe they would slaughter a rabbit and put that in there and put, you know, so there. This is like, you know, this is kind of, um, in a sense, like peasant food, huh. you know. And I, I'll tell you right now, peasant food is probably some of the best food you're ever gonna have on the on the planet. So yeah. I mean, it's you know, at one point in time, lobster was peasant food. So I mean, huh. it's it, it all comes around, it goes around, but um, yeah. So the the cool. Th Thing, I mean, things you can put in here, you can put, uh, if you wanted to go vegetarian, um, I would take out the, the chicken stock, you know, make a, uh, buy a good vegetarian stock or, or make a, a vegetable stock. Um, I would switch out the chicken and the chorizo, um, obviously, um, and do maybe some fennel. Um, I would maybe chop the, uh, the bell peppers uh, more kind of like a julienne so I get a little bit more texture. Um, you can add some lima beans, some fava beans in here, uh, artichokes, um, things to kind of bulk up. Um, you know, anything. So anything can go in here. It's, it's just kind of a, you know, paella and the rice is kind of the vessel. Um, but, you know, you can kind of create that flavor profile for however, you know, you're looking to, to do. It doesn't necessarily have to be, you know, um, you know, Spanish profile for paella. I mean, oh, everybody kind of the has their own paella, right? Yeah, I, I, I yeah, love I mean, that there's so many possibilities. Uh, we're getting questions. Um, yes. 
Uh, we're doing just fine, which is great. This may be my new favorite cooking show, Get Food Network on the phone. Done. I don't know their number, <laughs> but I can try and Google it. Um, are you guys? Oh, Mark. Mark Hanny. John Booz. What's up? Double fist bumps. Hey. Uh, are you guys going to do a new recipe every week? Mark, that's a great question. So we do one of these culinary academies, the Food Service Power Plant Culinary Academy, uh, once a month. So three weeks a month we do or so, give or take. We do a conversation three weeks a month with an industry leader. Um, next week, we have a fun surprise. And, and then once a month, we do a culinary show. So we've had Chris Filari, executive, uh, global executive chef for Sodexo on. We've had, oh my gosh, who else came on? Um, our first one. I'm forgetting it right now, but that's okay. It'll come back to me. Um, so yeah, so Chef Scott is tonight. And then I think next month or in a few weeks, we're going to have a chef out of, I think she's out of Alabama. Um, and she's actually my cousin, Kristen, I think is going to come on, which is going to be fun. And we're going to get more people and she's a part of the Food Service Power Plant Network. So we're going to highlight different chefs in the Power Plant Network. Mark, great question. Someone's loving the vegetarian option. Um, yes. And you know what? Awesome. If you want Only about that, the vegetarians. I, yeah. can send you the, I can send you a recipe for that. In fact, uh, the recipe I sent you has that recipe in it. Yeah, It's in there. I'll, I'll find a way to post it um, Perfect. so that if someone wants to do it, we'll post it. All right. I'm still moving, still I moving this, baby. I also sent you a really cool churro recipe that we don't have time tonight to make it, but we were talking about it. Super simple. Make it with your kids. Super easy. Churros. When I told my daughter that you had suggested it, and I was like, I'm not sure that I have, I'm gonna have the bandwidth in within this these walls. She was, um, I got it, I got the eye roll, which is what starts happening. I don't know if you're in that phase, Scott, but my daughter's 12, and the eye rolls. We're like nine months to a year into eye rolling. Um, we, uh, we are. I just, uh, I saw my first eye roll about two <laughs> weeks ago. It was. Um, it's kind of unnerving, you know, like, I, I mean, it was the full, like, what that, um, I mean, I like, I took a step back and I'm like, wait a second, this is, well, we, well, how did we get here? We weren't there before. Like it was, you know, one of those moments where you just literally need to be like, I need to sit down for a moment. Um, what just happens? <laughs> I, I know, man, I call it a reduction of perceived relevance of the dad. Your relevance still really, really matters. They just yeah. don't understand it right now. So perceived yeah. relevance is slowly going downhill. I don't understand Instagram <laughs> very well, so I mean nothing to my, you know, like to my daughter. It's, right. it's uh, this is really it funny. Is. This is awesome. Okay, so I'm gonna show you where we're at, and yeah, everybody, so you can see we're steaming. We got the pee. We got everything going on. Let me now. I'm gonna ask you to do something here. Put your ear to the paella. What do you hear? Kind of like a little crackling, or is it still kind of slurpy? No, I, can I would it. say it's, it's crackling. Can you hear it? Or do you yeah, think it's, it's a little slurpy still? It's close. It's close. You're really, okay. really close. So okay. you're just about to absorb the rest of that water. Yep. And now you're going to create that kind of, that the soul crust, the kind of the crust. So just keep turning it around. Yep. Even though you have your induction, and you know, your induction is really, really even um, with all that stuff where it is. Uh, just turning it around will, you know, there's there's still going to be hot spots in your pan itself uh, with the cast iron. So you're going to keep doing that. Um, your pea should be pretty close to being done. I'm going to try one. Let's just see. It's Although they're all sitting on the top. Yeah. They're just, peas are just, peas, once they're, once they're, frozen peas have already been blanched. So it's, they're already, it's, it's like frozen french fries have already been cooked once. So, you know, putting them in your oven, they come out much better because they've already been blanched in oil. It's not like cutting a regular French fry. And doing I got to tell you, that's contrary to whatever in my head, what I believe. I always, I always shied away from cooking something a day ahead and then like re-therming it. And I know it's a big part of like, you know, banquet cooking and all this kind of stuff. I mean, you got to cook ahead, you re-therm, et cetera. But I always shied away from it here. And maybe I need to not do that in my own house. It depends on what you're doing, right? I mean, like soup, stuff like that. I mean, like this stuff, I mean, I, I'll tell you right now, this is going to feed depends on you know eight to ten people somewhere around there um maybe six yeah. people if they're really hungry um but when you like tomorrow like grab a scoop of this and, and throw it in your microwave or just eat it cold like man it is amazing <laughs> so it's, um, Love if you it. do reheat it uh in your microwave i i like to take just like a teaspoon or a tablespoon of water 
and just kind of drizzle it around the, the water or in the rice huh. because the microwave microwave reacts with water. So if you've got something that's really dry, um, that's when you kind of create that like, you know, kind of like burnt microwave parts. You know, if you like take a pancake and microwave the pancake too long, it comes out all hard because you yeah. basically, you know, morph the, the starch and pull the water out of it. But if you took yep. that pancake and wrapped it in a paper towel that's been moistened with water, you'll steam that pancake and it will come out light and fluffy. So same kind of thing with this, you know, just create, you know, when you, if you microwave anything, touch of water, especially with pastas and rices or grains, a little bit of water, if you're gonna reheat it, it will steam it and you get a better kind of retherm than you would from just putting it in your microwave. And it being, especially with the rice, you'll get like some that are like really cooked together and others that are not the water, um, just a touch of water. You don't want anything that's gonna, you know, create like a liquid in the bottom. Um, yeah, but that will create the steam that you need to, to evenly uh, retherm your food. Good. I, I'm learning so much tonight, Jeff. This is incredible. Perfect. Oh. All right. So you look, it looks pretty good. Yeah. Just a little bit of steam coming off of there. So you got, you're just right. You're just going to be a little bit behind there. Let me see here. Oh, yeah. Yeah, you're right where I was and maybe about five minutes ago. Okay. So now you can see here. I've gotten to the point where I'm completely dry. Oh, wow. Yeah. That looks incredible. Oh, man, chef. So this Gosh. at this point is where we would want to just kind of let it sit for about five or ten minutes. Uh, once again, um, just creating kind of, you know, the, that you know, when, when things are – I have a lot of theories on cooking some of these things. Sometimes I, I, I love the science of cooking. But I also have a lot of theories, so I don't know if they're based in science. But, um, right. you know, a lot of times with, with cooking, I feel like when you're at the, the, the extremes, right, you, you lose a lot of the nuances. It's like if you've ever gone, you know, wine tasting um, and they pour, you know, a glass of cold white wine and you drink it, and you're like, I don't, I don't know if I've tasted anything. And you hold it in your hand a little bit and kind of warm it up. And then all of a sudden that's when the bouquet comes out and stuff like that. So, you know, when this is really, really hot, um, you know, it's kind of, it's once you kind of settle back down and it gets that normal, you're, you're, that's when you're really going to taste a lot of the nuance and the flavors and stuff like that. And not just, you know, necessarily burn the, the heck out of your tongue. Well, and, and I think, you know, look, sci uh, science certainly plays a role in all this and the techniques and et cetera, but, but so much, I think of what you do and really anyone in hospitality chef or any role we play in the industry is part what we know works and part art, right? It's part feel it out and let's try it. And you know, sometimes you just feel things that you feel and you got to run with. So I, I love it. I love it. Yeah. You, um, you, you really, with, with cooking, I mean, you, you, you've got to take, um, I, I would never, I always tell like my friends when I'm, when I'm cooking for them, um, or I'm, people are just coming over to my house and, and cooking. I always would say that if you're not paying me, then I'm experimenting on you. <laughs> and that's kind of what I do because, you know, I would want to try things out. And, you know, if you're paying me, I'm going to go with what I know works. Um, but if you're not, then you're kind of in my little, um, my little lab. And um, you know, it's going to be delicious, um, but uh, I'm going to play around with some of the flavors. So um, hope you enjoy. <laughs> that is an awesome yeah. way to do it. I think that's great. I love that. Yeah, you don't. I mean, with cooking, it's, you know, I'm also a big, I love to garden. Um, where we are right now, I have, um, I have eight chickens in my backyard. We, we raise chickens and I have four growing beds and I have a whole bunch of fruit trees. So, um, I, you know, I love starting stuff from seed, um, because it's, you, know, you take this tiny little seed and then it grows into this ginormous tomato plant that's, you know, 10 feet tall. Um, like, how does that work? <laughs> it just is so, it, it just baffles me on those things. So I just, I, as, as many times as I start seeds or I, or I cook something and this or that. I mean, it, it literally brings me back to being a kid. And and the older I get, the more I want to create those memories, right? It's like, yeah. you're always looking back to be a kid. You want to feel back. And that's why I love food. Cause you, know, you, you smell a dish and can, it moves you back to when you were five. Right. Yeah. I mean, almost like nothing in the world. I think for me, you know, my, my whole career or my whole world is, is basically my memories are based on food and music. It's like, mm -hmm. it's either a smell a flavor, yeah. a texture, or a sound. It's like how I remember everything. Um, and you're, you're so right about there. that. You're, right. yeah. you're so right. A, a meal can, I mean, I can smell cookies and I'm in my mm -hmm. grandmother's kitchen 
I can hear the red hot chili peppers and I'm in eighth grade with a big tie dye sheet that I pinned on my ceiling above my bed. <laughs> you're, you're right. Food and music have those ways of absolutely taking me back to a really specific time. Yep. Yep, definitely. So you look pretty good there. Yeah. Still see here. a little bit of a moisture there. Let's see where you're at. Yeah, I think you're looking pretty good. If you were to, I bet you, if you could, you could do a couple, you could do one or two things there. You could actually just let it rest right now, or you could let it go for a few more minutes and then, and then let it go. You got a little bit of steam there. So this, you know, the steam's obviously the moisture coming off of there. Um, but yeah, just the, um, just the, the difference in the, in the pan. Cause you would have, what is that? Like a 12, 10 or 12 inch pan right 12, there? Yeah. 12, 12 and a half. Yeah. So this is 18. So just that, you know, a little bit more, you know, creates, you know, how much faster we cook in yep, that sense, yep. right? So, but yeah, that's, yeah, you're looking really good right there. Oh, man, it this is, is so fun. Yeah. I've never even attempted anything like this, Scott. It, I'm so, so excited. <laughs> yeah, those are, that's the fun thing about cooking, right? I mean, it's really about doing things. I, that's what I love to do about cooking is trying something that I've never done before. Um, I also like to mess things up. I'm, I'm a bit, I've, I've probably done, you know, everybody started doing starters, you know, when this whole thing started. Um, yeah. I started making starters and like ruining on them and, and figuring out that and doing this because I, I, I wanted to, I, it was like a science experiment. It's like yeah. figuring out that stuff. So now I, I just started to, um, for Christmas, I got a, uh, a flour mill. So I just started milling my own flour and, um, wow, does that change a lot of stuff. <laughs> that is awesome. So I mean, fun. It, it's so different because the moisture content is way different in there. And so I'm, uh, I've, I've been, um, I've had this pan pancake recipe that I've been kind of working on for, well, I don't really work on it anymore, but I've had it for years and years and years. And um, my, my daughter can make it from scratch. Like that's probably the first recipe she's ever made before. Um, and, you know, it's just, I know how to make it from, I could, I could probably produce it in about three minutes, uh, just super quick. Um, but when I milled my own flour and the moisture content of the, the wheat berries was different than what you get commercially in flour, um, you know, it's, it changes you all back. You know, I've made that dish so many times. I've probably made 6,000 pancakes because I also do a breakfast with Santa every year for my daughter's school where we're just doing, we're making these scratch pancakes from scratch. Um, and bang, you know, back to like, what did I do wrong? What happened? What's this? What's that? You know, and going through and like, you know, Go, like in a detective, you know, what was this? How was that? Well, and I, I came back to saying, wow, it was the content, the moisture content of the flour, you know, cause it made a thicker, you know, a little bit more of a runny pancake and, and all those things. So, um, you know, one little variant can really, you know, take you away from, um, what you know, and, uh, you know, it brings you back, you know, and it's just, you know, it's just the constant change, right? You know, the only constant is change in, in the world. You know, get used to it. <laughs> yeah, no kidding, right? Bob, and if you're not flexible, you're, you'll be broken pretty quick. We're right now. Okay, you ready? Listen. I think you're good. Can you hear, can you hear it? Yeah, you hear a little, I hear a little crackling. Yeah. Yeah, let it, I would say let it go for just a, one more minute and then take it off and let it rest for a few minutes and you're, you're set. Oh, I'm so excited. So you can see this. So I, my, since mine was done a little bit earlier, I'm actually, I can, I can pull it apart and kind of show you a little bit of the textures and stuff. Um, let me grab a spoon here. I'm going to pull this. Oh, I almost fell off. I'm going to pull this off so you can see here. Oh yeah. Rad. All right. So here, so when you go here, so you can pull it back. Oh man, look at that. Oh, let me see, right? So you're going to see how beautiful the rice is cooked. Oh, it looks incredible. Look at that. I can, oh. I can cook, but I'm not that good of a cameraman. <laughs> That's okay. No, no. That's, you, but the key you, part of this, the, the one thing that you'll realize and you see from this is like, you know, you'll, you can actually see the glycerin of the oil from the, from the chorizo in there and stuff like that. And the plumbiness. I mean, it's, it's, that rice has got so much love that we put into it. And that's, that's really what we were looking for. So it's, um, yeah, it's a beautiful thing there. 
Oh, it's looking great. There's a few bubbles. A little, not a I need a little contrast. I need a little my little peas and my little. Uh, you can also put at the right at the end. You can put your parsley in there, so it's just going to give you a little bit of herbaceousness into it. Once again, it's kind of you know playing around. So much of what we taste is you know like it's it's. I always developed on flavors for so long. And then, you know, it really became about the textures of the food. Yeah. Um, and that is such a key. I mean, I almost feel like the texture of the food is almost more, plays more to how you, uh, you know, you perceive the, the flavor of it than anything. Uh, should I put the parsley in of... now, Chef? Yeah, pop that sucker in. And does this look like too much? It seemed like it was half a bunch, but maybe that's more than I'm supposed to have. I would just take it, take a handful and just... That seems like a good amount, yeah. Not that hand, yeah, like a small handful, like a child's handful. There you go. Child's handful. There we go. Yeah. Sprinkle it around. You can get real chefy. You gotta just do it real high. Oh yeah, I go. know. You're, you're right. The, the <laughs> higher you go, the better the chef you are. I'm gonna start from up here. Right, see right. If it lands in. There we go. We got some that didn't quite make it, but some that did. I I I, I worked with cooks that were like, you know, they'd sit down there and they would. They would hold the fish down here and put their hand up here and just like sprinkle it. And you're just like, <laughs> I, I, I see what you're doing and I kind of understand what you're doing because at, you know, when you do something, so when you, when you're, when you're a line cook um, and when I worked like at the montage or different things, I always worked at restaurants where we changed the menu quite a bit um, seasonally. So you do a menu for like three months or four months. I mean, you do that dish a thousand times, you know, and, when you first start doing that dish, it morphs over the time. So like, you, sure. know, you might start this dish in September, and by the time you kind of are through it in November, you know, it's changed so much. You've cooked this so many times, and you, you look at it, and you're constantly saying, well, I want to change this, I want to change that. So, I mean, that's that's what I really love. You know, part of me, why I kind of miss restaurants a little bit is because when you go to those good restaurants, and you, and you have the passion and cooks in there, I mean, they are constantly getting better. And what they're doing yeah. so i mean even yeah. in the same you know people always say oh i want the consistency consistency it's like i i totally get that and i don't want to go to a restaurant and have it be you know subpar from where i wanted it where i had it before but i'm always about it tasting different or better because flavors taste different and better you know everybody wants consistency and i totally get that but on my sense of the food i really like to have um i like to, I like to see the story behind you know what what was the story that was cooked yeah con I'm always constant out of power. Never you power improvement. Yeah. you're 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 always improving i mean that that's another theme in power plant is you're oh, we're always growing we're always evolving we're always changing i'm like you scott i'm looking uh, i mean my power on my phone is good i'm gonna probably change headphones in a minute i'm gonna change my uh I think I all right this. i'm turning this baby off scott yeah turn it off and just let it rest Letting her ride. I'm gonna have a sip of wine. Yep. What kind of, what because, kind of wine are you drinking? Oh, for um, I'm drinking the white stuff. Whatever, um, whatever my my bride Shannon gave me is what I'm drinking. The white right stuff. Now. Pro that sounds probably, that sounds delicious. Probably something from Raymond or Buena Vista, if I were to guess. Um, Raymond. I I am a member at Raymond. Does Raymond Wineries. Out? Yeah. In Napa. Scott. Raymond Vineyards. Talk Oh yeah, JC, so JCB, JCB Wine. Did you did you see our conversation with him? I did not. I missed it, but I was like, well, I know you saw it when it's coming up there. I was like, oh my god, man, I go to their wineries all the time. Like, I love it is it. some. That is one of the most eccentric wineries you've ever you'll ever go to. It is. I mean, you you you've interviewed JCB. I mean, his personality is in that winery. You oh know, my it's, god. Um, lots of um, uh, baccarat crystal. And mannequins kind of all over the place in like big hairdresses. I mean, it's it is just over the top. And we went uh, wine tasting in their like red velvet room. Oh, it's just like oh, everything's like room. velvet. Yeah, it's just like wow. It's just like it was yeah, just a super fun experience. So it's uh, someday, you know, Scott. Let's mark this down. Me, you, and Jeff are going to meet at Raymond. And uh, Shannon just raised her hand. She's going to be there because she wants to meet you guys. We will share some wine and some food and we'll enjoy Raymond together because it's one of, it's probably our most, in terms of our marriage and relationship, we probably have more memories at Raymond consistent yeah. than anywhere else. And we just love it. So we are in with you guys. That will be so much fun. Yeah, definitely. We, um, we have, you know, that, 
I, I love Napa up there because it is, it's it's very much kind of like the food scene, right? I mean, it's the big family up there, right? If if one person's hurting, you know, everybody comes to their aid, and you yeah. know that's you know just kind of a lesson that we all need to keep learning. Um, but we have, you know, so you know, we've had we've had a pretty hard time here in California this year with you know fires and and COVID and all those things, and um, it's it's the resilience up there is pretty amazing, you know, and, and you know, no matter what's going on, you know, they are just so gracious up there, and it's just, mm-hmm. you know, there's um, there's people that you know lost their homes, and they're sitting there pouring you wine, and you, they're just sitting there, you know, asking you questions, and they've lost everything. And you're like, what the heck? I mean, if that's yeah. if that's not just like kind of human spirit, I don't know what is. So it's um, it's it is a uh, a beautiful place. You know, we live in a beautiful country, and um, yeah, it's just different parts of it are so it's so much fun to experience. So. Uh, for sure. Really wonderfully said. You said that perfectly, frankly. Um, hospitality at its finest, right? I, I, That's I, right. I looked at the definition of hospitality not too long ago because I'm working on a project. And I, I think it said um, receiving others who have just come off a long journey, I believe was one of the definitions, or simply like taking care of others. And um, you all in your part of the world do that as well as anywhere in the world. It's key. It's key. You know, it's, you know? it's definitely, you know, community and, and all those things are super important. So can you hear me? Okay. Right now, Scott, I can. Yeah. Okay. okay. So my headphones just died. So I'm going to see if I can pull it off without the, um, the other headphones. Someone just let us know if you hear an echo for some reason. And I'm going to show you this baby. It is set. It's it. settled down at this point. There you go. Oh yeah. It's looking good. You should be proud of yourself, man. That's good. Sh- chef, thanks for walking a knucklehead like me through it. I mean, clearly you're a good <laughs> teacher if you can get me through this thing. This is awesome. Anybody I'm so excited. Yeah, no, it was, it's, it's, it's one of those things, you know, it, it's mysterious and, and mystic when you don't know. Um, but that's the fun part about cooking is that it's usually much simpler than, than you, you expect it to. You kind of build it up in your head to being like, oh, my God, what is all this other stuff? Like, take the churros. I mean, you can make the churro batter literally in about two minutes, and you can be fine then. I mean, you can literally think, I want churros, and have eating them in about 15 minutes. Wow. Not, you know, they're super, super simple. So that's kind of everything in life. You know, it's just like it's mysterious until you uh, take a dive at it. Then, you know, it's, wow, why was, I, why was this so crazy? I denied myself for this for so long. So um, don't deny yourself good food anymore like paella. Everybody can do this. You don't need to have the pan. Just have the passion. Here, here, here's what I would say to anybody watching too. I, I think of it often in terms of, I think of the beliefs I have about what's possible, like fences, like different fences around me. And I think about them around my head. And every time I try something new and we pull it off or we find a way to grow or I learn something, it's like I'm pushing that fence out just a little bit and it's giving me a greater sense of freedom or accomplishment or confidence. And so all these little moments are like little fences that I had. I never in a million years would have thought I could do paella. You showed me that I was incorrect. You just challenged a limiting belief in me and that fence post that existed is now pushed out a teeny bit and I have a little bit more room to run. And so all of these moments are just confidence builders. They're the removing of, of, of limiting beliefs that hold me back and frankly, just just increase my belief in what I'm capable of. So I, I love it and I'm grateful for it. 100%, 100%. So I'm gonna show you a little bit. So that, see that brown right there? Oh yeah. That's the silk rice. That's the, the crispiness that you're kind of looking for on there. Oh man. And it's not something that necessarily comes the first time. You know, it's all about, you know, it's all about kind of understanding that. You want to try a little bit of that? Well, I've got some, I'll tell you, I'm, I'm looking at the bottom right now. So I'm, scoop, I'm yep. scooping around a little bit and yep. I've got a brown. It's not necessarily coming up easily. And now so just kind of maybe I through. burned it. I don't know, but. It's, you know what you, with cooking sometimes, you know, you kind of have to go to this side and that side to kind of understand. So allow yourself to make the mistakes. It's the only way you learn. Well, I'll tell you though, it smells incredible. So I don't know that I messed anything up because you guided me and it smells. Am I allowed to taste it yet or no? 
Yes. Yes. That's a hundred percent. You you have to taste it. You can't give it to somebody else without tasting it. Although I right, just gave it to somebody hold else. On, hold on. Let me get a um, <laughs> my um. You have to get both. My daughter is like waving hands in the air because um, <laughs> she's like, Dad, come on, man, come on, give me some love. <laughs> let's give let's give you a little love, babe. You ready? There you go. Oh, first taste, first impressions. Oh, here we go. Okay. Oh. That would be enough. Here we go. You gonna try this with me? All right, let's do this together. Fingers crossed. Is it hot? If it doesn't taste good, it's something that you did, not that I did. That's really good. Scott, it's awesome, man. Oh my gosh. Here, here's a little bit of what I put. I just put a little bit in the bowl here. Oh yeah. Perfect. It is hot. Yep. <laughs> you you were just cooking it, so that's a good thing. If it was cold, yeah. we'd have an issue. So. It is. Um, okay, so here's what I'll tell you. Um, I started tasting it on kind mm -hmm. of the, because you were talking about the whole tongue earlier. And I started on the front, and then as it was kind of hanging around in there, I noticed I started something was happening on the back of my tongue too. And I was like, I'm tasting this on my whole tongue, like Scott said, not something I've ever thought about in my 43 years of life before until that moment. But um, but every part of my tongue was really active in that in that minute. It was it was awesome. Yeah, it's you know there there's a lot of tongue kind of analogies and stuff like that, and people say, oh, you taste you know this this flavor on this part of your tongue or this part flavor on your part of your tongue. Um, I don't necessarily believe in that. And then there's a lot of, you know, there's, I don't know if it's been scientifically proven if it's not then or that or that, um, but there's a lot of research to saying that, you know, every taste bud can taste everything on your tongue. And it's really about kind of the envelopment of it. Um, and I can kind of make, um, I sometimes I play my own devil advocate because I could probably make a, 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 a argument for the latter, but, um, you know, with this, it's when you when you start tasting those things, it, it really is the layering of those flavors on there and adding those layers in there. And like I was saying, so like, you know, when you're that's part of why I love being, you know, a cook or why I just love to cook um, cause I, um, is is the way that you put it in there. The way that you saute it is how people prevent. So, you know, if you would have just thrown everything in there and put the put the chicken stock in there and let it go and you didn't saute any of that. Yeah, you wouldn't have developed that depth of those flavors and stuff like that. Yeah. So you can, you know, it's just, it's so fun to be kind of like the, you know, the Wizard of Oz when you're, you're playing and have ultimate control. Um, that's really what's fun about cooking is you can play around with it and then somebody can actually taste the results with that. And then, um, you know, it's, uh, it's just, it's magical. You know, it's, it's like, I, like I said, I've been, I was a working chef for 23 years and I would, not only with every party I would I would do, I'd always get nervous, kind of like a little bit of stage fright. And about maybe ten years into it, I, I thought, like God, I you know, what is wrong with me? Why do I you know, I've done a thousand events. Why am I still, you know, afraid to do this or or wake up at, at two o'clock in the morning, um, which is the I do my best thinking at two o'clock in the morning. Um, you know, the night before and trying to figure out what I'm going to do. And, you know, why do I, why do I still have that? You know, why I've done enough of these. Um, and it wasn't until about maybe about seven years ago that I realized, you know, that's my edge. It's the fact mm -hmm. that I don't get comfortable with all any of this stuff that it doesn't, you know, because I care about it so much um, that it's so fragile to me that I could lose it so easily, even though I've spent 20, you know, 30 plus years cooking or whatever. Um, it's still such a fragile thing to me, um, yeah. that it can be lost really easily. So I, I never take it for granted in those, in, the, in that sense. So it's, um, yeah, it's, it's just one of those things. So still to this day, I get, I was nervous about doing this today. So it's, uh, it's, it's always those things about, you know, and like taking it and understanding it and kind of doing, you know, maybe the, uh, the exercises to kind of think about, you know, why you, why you, why you feel that way. But I know that that is what makes me, you know, uh, or where it makes me got, to, made me get to the level that I got to, um, yes. is because of that. You know, I never, I used to tell my cooks all the time, um, 
you know, we don't have an ego. You know, you guys are not allowed to have an ego. The only ego can be in your food. Let your mm-hmm. food have the ego and you will do great. But the moment that you actually take on that ego, you know, you're going to slip and start making less delicious food and you're not going to know it. And you're going to continually to make less delicious food thinking you're the best in the world and your food is going to slip. And, you know, eventually you're going to make this dish and you think it's the greatest and people are going to know, what is this? You know, it's like, don't let yourself go down that road, you know, be, you know, still be scared. It's okay to be scared with those things. So that's what makes it real. You know, you're alive. If you're scared, you're alive. So it's, uh, it's something I embrace now for sure. And it's, uh, even though I still have to tell myself every time I get scared, embrace this. <laughs> so it's not something yeah. that I've learned, but um, it's something that I have a process for now. Um, so that I can actually kind of say, okay, you know, this is, uh, this is the reason why, you know, and from parties when, um, so I ran a catering company in Oakland. We used to do this party in uh, Walnut Creek, uh, Lester Center. It was 600 people played it. And we would, you know, create the tents and create these kitchens and build everything from scratch because it was literally the road that people drove on. And, um, man, that was, like, so oh. intense of a play, so intense of a feeling. But the moment that that was done – you know, the kind of like the, you know, just the, when you're able to kind of exhale with all that stuff and, and take it, you know, keep it at that level. It's like, you know, it's, it's, that's, that's the level you want to keep it at. You know, you, it's, it's not worth doing unless you're, you know, it's, there's something to learn from it. So um, that's what food is for me. For sure. God, you just nailed it. And I think it's a great <laughs> lesson for people is, you know what, you're that anxiety, that desire, that waking up at two, um, it, it shows that you want to do it well. It shows that you care. And yeah. frankly, for the people, sometimes people have anxiety going into a moment because they're unprepared. That's not you. Sometimes yeah. we have anxiety because we want it to be beautiful. We want it to be great. We want it to touch people. So if you're one of those people out there watching right now, well, listening to Scott speak just his heart, just open it up to you. And, you know, you're, you're, you always wonder, gosh, why do I still get anxious about something? Or why do I still wake up at two in the morning trying to perfect something? guess what? It's probably because you care. And um, don't lose that. The minute you stop caring and stop waking up might be a minute that it's worth evaluating. Wait a minute. I wonder if I should be thinking about this differently. Um, you know, consider it a gift because you're, you're hearing from one of, you know, the, the greatest chefs in our community and one of the greatest people. And this is someone who was a career chef for 23 years or so. He's now um, he evolved his life so that he could raise his family and be present with his daughter, which is beautiful on a million more levels. And, um, and, and so just, um, I don't know, go easy on yourself because if you get up in the two in the morning and you're so anxious at yourself or you're trying something new, just consider it a gift. And you know what? Say this, it means I care as opposed to what's wrong with me. It means I care. And that changes the perception of the whole moment and your ability to perform moving forward. So, um, Scott, I I gotta tell you, this meal is incredible. I had some chorizo, in there and it's uh my mouth is just coming alive right now my family is like gonna <laughs> like break down the walls to get back in this kitchen and just knock it over to get some of this hey listen i i can't thank you by the way um rob Connolly, our brother at henny penny and nafum says you don't need the pan just have the passion love yep. it um shannon's rob we love you buddy um great I, i'm glad you picked up on that moment shannon solomon my partner in crime awesome uh, another Facebook, I can't see who that one is, but oh my gosh, this is so good. Um, we are grateful for you. This community continues to be a place of connection, of sharing hearts, of sharing stories, of acknowledging whatever's going on inside and, um, and, and finding ways to flip the perception of that moment and to turn it into greater joy and greater success and greater change. Scott, listen, I, I really want to thank you. You gave a bunch of time putting this together, a bunch of time with us tonight, you and Jeff and your team and your beautiful new test kitchen. Let me just say thanks yeah, for beautiful. putting all this energy into making our lives better tonight. Well, I just want to thank you because, you know, with, you know, it takes a vision for all this to happen. And, you know, as a community, I feel like we all have a, a part to play, but it takes that visionary in order to kind of create that spark. And so I really appreciate the spark that you've created for us. Um, and I hope that we're all running with it. Um, but you know, it, it really does take a vision and, and we're all running from your vision 
Um, and we, I really appreciate that. And um, it's just something that, you know, we'll, we can always continue to share. And um, I'm just uh, excited to be a part of this and to continue to learn from everybody else because that's, that's really the, the key to life is, is, is to learn from other people's experiences. So I hope you learned a little bit from mine. I'm excited to learn from uh, you know, upcoming cooking classes and from the upcoming uh, conversation. So thank you very much for your time tonight. And uh, I hope you, you guys all make this dish because it's super simple. Uh, you don't need the pan. Like you said, just have the passion and uh, have fun with it and, ma and make something that's yours. Heck yes, yeah, you, yeah. You, you said it beautifully. We're grateful for you. Everyone watching this video, I'll get to YouTube some point this week. You're welcome to go watch it back. Listen to, I mean, this was as much a cooking class as it was an, just an opening of soul. And I mean, really just a lot of beautiful lessons along the way on developing as a person, cultivating passion, taking risk. I mean, Scott is, is a, the epitome of trying something you're afraid of, you're terrified of and watching it create this flame inside that you can't put out. So um, listen to that, go back and watch it. Everyone, we're grateful for you. You're doing it. Uh, talk about a night of creativity and trying something new and pushing those boundaries, pushing out those limiting beliefs and um, keep doing that. We're doing it together. Uh, you know, Scott and Jeff and their team and us and you, we're all in this together. It truly feels like a forest that we've faced a hurricane. And uh, our buddy Rob keeps telling us the hurricane's getting smaller. And uh, we'll be back out there soon having paella together, sharing wine and clinking glasses together. That day is coming really soon. So keep going. If you've got a friend in food service that needs a place to connect, needs a place to be inspired, to um, feel that they're known, to push some boundaries, welcome them in, invite them into the community. We'd love to have them. Um, go check out Jeff and Scott and the Inform Group and all the cool changes that they're making in Northern California. Super proud of you guys. Another example for all of us in terms of taking risk in times of challenge. Times of challenge and you know anxiety, everything we're going through aren't the times we sit on our hands. They're not the times we just sit back. They're the times we try new things and we evolve and we grow and we dream. And um, I think it'll pay dividends for you guys. Everybody, lots of love. We will see you soon. Have a great night, Scott. Have a great night, brother. Thank you very much. Have a great night, everybody.